thank you to the organizers and for everybody sticking around after lunch. So uh, Simon introduced this morning that I'd be leading off, you know, a virus host interaction kind of session. And I would say, you'll see my talk is probably more about virus conflict with other mobile genetic elements. Of course, this all happens within the realm of the host cell. And we, ind we indeed care about the host cell, but it's really conflict between mobile elements that I'll be talking about today. All right, so my lab thinks about lytic um, bacteriophages specifically. So these are viruses that engage with specific receptors on the cell surface, inject their double-stranded DNA genomes, and then elaborate a very wonderfully orchestrated transcriptional and translational program to take over the host cell machinery, replicate their genome, and assemble structural virions, which house newly replicated genomes. These new progeny viruses can go on to, of course, replicate or to uh, lyse the cell and release into the environment to in infect and kill neighboring cells. So this, of course, imposes a tremendous um, selective force on bacteria, and bacteria have to evolve mechanisms to defend themselves against viral predation. And for those of you that have picked up any journal recently, you're probably inundated with diverse mechanisms of defense. So I'm going to overly simplify this incredibly complex field right now with this very simple cartoon. So bacteria can acquire genes that um, render them resistant to viruses. By and large, we are starting to see a pattern that mobile um, genetic elements confer phage resistance. So they are the things that are carrying these cargo genes that give the bacterium the resistance against a given virus. These can manifest at the level of the cell surface, but by and large, these mechanisms that block phage attachment come with fitness costs for bacteria. So they, by and large, cannot um, change their cell surface to, to adapt to viral predation because those surface molecules are required for their life some, in some other aspect. So really, most mechanisms are kind of at the intracellular level. Once the phage DNA gets into the cell, these defense mechanisms can adopt many different mechanisms. Some you will have undoubtedly heard about, things like CRISPR-Cas and restriction enzymes can act to degrade the viral genome before the replication program is initiated. If the host cell does not have such a defense or the virus can evade it, then it will continue its um, attempt at replicating in the cell. And there are a plethora of mechanisms that have evolved to sense the um, viral infection and ultimately lead to an abortive infection phenotype, which results in the single infected cell dying in response to viral infection, which is not good for the single cell, but it's good for the population, of course, because the virus cannot complete its replication cycle and the neighboring cells can survive. So this is incredibly overly simplified. You know, 15 years ago, I think we knew about less than five or 10 mechanistically distinct defense systems, and now we're upwards of, I think, 70 at last count, which is probably grossly out of date by last week. Um, and so this is really amazing emerging field when it comes to diverse mechanisms. Um, my lab is primarily, we're definitely interested in molecular mechanisms, but we really wanted to look at a model system in which we could really deeply understand what defense systems matter to a given bacterium in nature. Right? By just looking at sequences, we don't know which is actually on, which is engaging with which viruses, which viruses a, a given bug is encountering. Right, Most bacteria harbor many defense systems in their genomes. And it's really not clear kind of hierarchy exists if one dominates over the other, et cetera. So my lab set out to really set up a model system to study these dynamics from uh, a clinical point of view. So we study vibrio cholera, which I'll get into in a moment. We um, we isolate samples and we study these samples over time. And a couple of the key things that I'm gonna hit on today that are in this theme of phage defense are we really want to understand, you know, knowing that these phage defense systems are often localized to mobile genetic elements, how did the biology of the mobile genetic element contribute to phage defense? And how do they disseminate these traits to new hosts, right? So we're very interested in that. And I'll tell you a story about um, one of our favorite ones today. And that has a very clever way of disseminating to new hosts. And then we're also very interested in discovery of phage encoded inhibitors that undoubtedly drive the diversification of these defense systems in nature. Um, but we, as a sort of we globally in the field, you know, we have a pretty limited handle on phage encoded inhibitors compared to the many defense systems we have cataloged. 
The one exception I would say are CRISPRs and anti-CRISPRs. It's very clear from, from that beautiful work that the diversification of CRISPR-Cas systems is driven in large part by these amazing phage encoded inhibitors. And undoubtedly those same kind of parallels are at play for all of these other mechanisms, but we don't have a good handle on phage encoded inhibitors. Oftentimes, in my opinion, because people study these systems in heterologous hosts, heterologous hosts with phages that are not really encountering those defense systems in nature. So they haven't had the pressure to evolve inhibitors. All right, so to establish sort of a model system, we focus on Vibrio cholera as our bacterial host. So this is um, an aquatic um, facultative pathogen. So it can live freely in aquatic reservoirs, emerge to cause disease in humans following the ingestion of contaminated food or water. So in that niche, it causes watery diarrhea, which helps it disseminate back into the aquatic environment and facilitates its travel back into um, other um, individuals. It's been known for a long time that phages are of course associated with Vibrio cholera. Lytic phages are associated with Vibrio cholera in aquatic reservoirs, no surprise to this audience. Um, but we also know that these phages must be co-ingested along with their bacterial host into individuals because we find a subset of these same phages in stool samples of cholera patients, right? So this is a scenario where Vibrio cholera is attempting to replicate and cause disease in a human host, it is being inundated by phages that are attempting to kill it. And we hypothesize that those strains that are ultimately most successful must have ways of defending against viruses in order to help them um, continue to flourish in that niche. We also think that this is a great model system for studying mechanisms of defense or phage um, resistance that could be at play in other clinical environments, right? We don't see the evolution of phage resistance at the level of cell surface receptors, because all of these phages use essential molecules that, that the Vibrio host needs to colonize the small intestine. So you don't see loss of those receptors, you see intracellular mechanisms of defense. All right, so the other sort of half of this, of course, is the, the phage that we study. And this is sort of a very intriguing observation that I, that I started to make as a postdoc that is still continuing on now that I have my own lab. I had a set of samples as a postdoc that was collected over a decade long period at a hospital in Bangladesh. And they were cholera patient samples. We knew they were phages in some of them, but nobody had really cared enough to look at what those phages were. And as a phage biologist, I really wanted to get to know the phages in the system. So I started isolating and characterizing, sequencing them. And I kept finding basically the same phages over and over again. Um, and I assure you, it is not phage contamination. <laughs> um, and so this phage I called ICP-1. I named it for the first phage that I isolated from this hospital, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. And I expected to catalog hundreds of these, but I pretty much stopped at ICP-3 because the diversity within cholera patient samples is extraordinarily low. We've now um, sequenced many of these phages from patient samples, primarily in Bangladesh, also in India and in Africa. We found the same phage in these locations. We now have phages collected that are highly similar between 1992, our oldest is from India, all the way through current on this um, particular uh, genomic map, it's just through 2019. So these are individual ICP-1 genomes that are stacked up um, each concentric ring is a genome. They're color-coded by location and organized from the oldest to the most um, recent. The outermost ring represents the um, genes that the phages encode, and they're colored by whether or not they're conserved or not in all of these isolates. So some of these isolates are remarkably conserved, even among the most temporally isolated samples, so over 25 years apart. We have isolates that share over 99% nucleotide identity over 75% of their genome. So huge core genome here that's highly conserved. And that of course encodes things that we can actually predict function for, which is not always easy in phage genomes. It includes DNA replication machinery, structural proteins, things like that. And then there's a large swath of genes here, for example, where you have gaps in the alignment. Some phages have these genes and other phages do not. And what we're coming to realize is that these sort of variable components of the phage genome by and large represent counter adaptations to changing and fluctuating defense systems in Vibrio cholera. So these phages don't hang on to counter defense inhibitors or defense inhibitors unless they're confronting these defenses in Vibrio. And the defenses in Vibrio, there's some stagnant ones in the genome that we see all the time. 
but epidemic strains do vary and they do um, sort of fluctuate their defense systems. So we can use this collection of phages to our advantage along with these Vibrio strains to study sort of co-evolution of what has happened in nature. So the idea here is, is pretty simple, right? We can take our collection of phage and our collection of Vibrio and we can ask, okay, well, if bacteria from the future are resistant to phage from the past, then they have acquired some resistance trait and we can, we can attempt to find it. Um, and these are all tractable. So we can use a lot of genetics and a little bit of bi biochemistry to delve into mechanism. And then similarly, we can take phage from the future and ask, can they now plaque or overcome those defensive barriers that once existed? And indeed we find evidence of that. So that's sort of our, our system to study coevolution. Um, and I'm gonna start off by telling you about sort of one of the favorite mechanisms of antiphage activity that we discovered in my lab that's encoded in epidemic strains of cholera. So this is where it really gets to a story about competing mobile genetic elements, okay? So the element I'm gonna tell you about is the phage-inducible chromosomal island-like element called PLE for short, because that's too much of a mouthful. The phenotype of a PLE-positive host is very striking. So here's a bacterial lawn in gray. If you take a PLE minus strain and you drop tenfold dilutions of phage, you get these beautiful black spots or zones of clearance, which are plaques representing successful infection. If you take an isogenic host that has this element, which is 18 kilobases in length, about 25 open reading frames, no obvious antiphage activity, totally blocks plaque formation. It's even more impressive when you do burst assays, you see that the phage goes from making 90 infectious progeny in 20 minutes under laboratory conditions to zero. And you can never get escape phages under laboratory conditions. And it will become hopefully obvious why as I explain how this works. So as I mentioned, um, when I first discovered this, the really the only identifiable kind of hallmark gene here was an integrase, a hallmark of mobile genetic elements, but that was kind of it. Um, and I'm gonna kind of show you the punchline and then go through some of my favorite mechanisms. The punchline is that PLE is a viral satellite or a parasite of this virus, ICP-1. It resides integrated in the chromosome it is induced to excise and replicate upon phage infection. It inhibits the phage through many mechanisms, and I'll explain a few in my talk today. It inhibits it, but precisely, so that it can actually steal structural proteins that the virus is otherwise making to house its own genome. And it instead incorporates its own genome into these particles and then spreads that genome um, from infected cells. So the net result is that this MGE the selfish mobile element gets to spread as a result of phage infection. And it's also beneficial to the host cell population because the individual infected cell produces no lytic virus. So the surviving, the cells in the vicinity can survive, okay? So this is a defense mechanism as we view it from the cellular point of view, but it's also really conflict with another mobile genetic element that's driving this. Um, this sort of relationship is, sort of adequately described or very nicely described, I should not say adequate, very nicely described by this quote by Eugene Kunin, a parasite's parasite saves host's neighbors. He wrote this quote in describing an analogous system, um, which is in a totally different domain of life. So giant viruses are parasitized by these virophages and these giant viruses infect their protist hosts. And these virophages help to mitigate or dampen down the successful infection by these giant viruses and help to protect the cellular host, right? These types of interactions of sort of viruses of viruses across domains of life have been studied in, in plants and in, in humans with hepatitis B and hepatitis delta virus. And they're well studied in bacteria, um, for example, in the context of Staphylococcus aureus, which is the cell on the bottom, which um, have uh, Staph aureus pathogenicity islands, which are conceptually similar. They start integrated in the chromosome, a phage comes in, they are induced to steal the structural material from that phage and then spread those pathogenicity related genes to other organisms. So these interactions exist across domains of life. They're hard to identify, right? The satellite viruses um, are not related to the viruses that they parasitize. So it can be hard to predict who's the host to the virus. And you need a compatible tripartite system to study these on a molecular level. You need a susceptible cell, you need a susceptible virus, and you need 
the right parasite. And as I'll show you, there's antagonism, of course, between the virus and this parasite. So there's mechanisms of defense occurring at that level too. So you could miss these interactions by just pairing the wrong things together. Um, it's starting to become clear in bacteria that there are many unrelated families of these satellites. The pleas are one of them. Um, and there's some in other gram negatives and, and gram positives as well. And these have emerged independently. They use functionally distinct mechanisms, but they've converged on sort of similar strategies. It's really amazing. All right, so let's get into some of the detail here. Um, so as I mentioned, plea resides integrated in the chromosome. Upon infection by ICP1, we know that plea excises. We knew, or we thought we knew that this was a specific interaction. We don't see the plea responding to unrelated viruses. Um, and my first graduate student discovered that this is because a phage encoded protein that's produced early in infection um, called PEX-A actually binds and interacts with the plea encoded large serine recombinase, which is an integrase whose job it is, is to facilitate the excision and integration of the plea in response to specific cues. So this allows the plea to excise in response to phage infection. Um, the plea then initiates its replication cycle by stealing replication machinery from the phage. The phage attempts to replicate. So everything, you know, early in infection is kind of proceeding almost normally. Um, we discovered that the, during infection of a plea positive host, an essential transition before, um, that the virus DNA has to make during replication, which is from bidirectional theta replication, um, to this rolling circle mechanism is blocked by PLE. So many double-stranded DNA viruses have to initiate this transition so that they can create the concatamers that are packaged into the virions, okay? So this is an essential step for packaging. We knew that this was blocked um, during um, PLE positive infection. And we initially hypothesized this is because the PLE is stealing replication machinery. The PLE replicates to nearly a thousand copies in 20 minutes, it's astounding. And so we thought just the fact that it's stealing the, the replication machinery from the virus makes it not available to the virus and it can't transition. Turned out not to be true. This actually occurs even when the plea does not replicate. Um, so we set out to sort of discover what this mechanism could be. And we used a deep sequencing approach um, and observed that the viral genome was actually being nicked or cleaved at specific sites during infection in the presence of plea. And we identified a nickase encoded by the plea that actually targets the, the phage as it's trying to transition to rolling circle replication. We named this enzyme NIX-I. So it cleaves the, the phage genome right at sort of the transition time point. It's precisely expressed at that key time point. And this is sufficient to block the phage from, from forming new progeny. So this is just one mechanism that it's on its own is totally sufficient. I will add that one thing that's very um, interesting about this enzyme is that we don't understand how plea protects itself from this enzyme. We know that it's a site-specific nickase, but actually if you clone that site onto the plea, it is resistant to activity by that enzyme. So that's um, sort of a mystery. All right, so all the while the phage is attempting to complete its life cycle, part of this stage of the life cycle involves producing structural proteins that it is attempting to use to package its own genome. At this stage, the plea recruits those proteins and instead packages its own genome into these plea-like particles or plea-phage-like particles. So these are housing the, the plea genome. And I always forget to say this critical piece of information, which is that everything in red is plea encoded and everything in blue is phage encoded. That would have been helpful five minutes ago. Um, but regardless, what happens at the end is that a plea encoded protein along with phage encoded proteins mediate lysis of the bacterial cell. This actually happens a little faster than the phage would otherwise program it to be um, by virtue of this membrane protein, the plea encodes with I. These, um, these plea particles then can go on to adopt the same receptor requirements and host entry mechanisms as the phage. So they simply bind to Vibrio cholera and they can effectively inject the plea genome, but the plea is not capable of carrying out a complete viral life cycle. It doesn't have all the genes that it needs to do that to kill the host. And so what it does instead is it uses that same um, large serine recombinase integrase to integrate into the host chromosome at a specific attachment sequence um, using a cognate attachment sequence on the circularized plea genome. 
to give you a plea positive recipient um, that can go on to survive, of course, because there's no virus being produced. So this cell um, can survive, the plea genome persists, and should it encounter ICP-1 in the future, the same reaction will occur. So if you've been playing sort of um, close attention to the cartoons, you will, you will note that these virions not only contain the plea genome, but they look a little different, and that's very much on purpose. We knew um, early on from electron microscopy work that the plea is packaged into modified virions. So the plea does not encode a complete suite of structural proteins. So these virion proteins are coming from the phage, but it's manipulating how they're assembled to its own benefit. Um, and so you can see this here for the EMs. You can see that the capsids here are really tiny compared to ICP-1's capsids. Now the plea genome is only about 18 kilobases. The phage genome is about 120 kilobases. So this is a mechanism by which plea can force the assembly of small capsids to restrict the packaging of the phage genome. So even if the phage manages to evade the, um, the nicking endonuclease, you can actually get only incomplete phage genomes packaged into these smaller capsids. So this is another mechanism that by itself is inhibitory. And a graduate student in my lab has been looking for um, the mechanism of how this works. And through a series of genetic and biochemistry experiments, we've narrowed it down to a single protein that we call TCAP. And this protein for TCAP makes tiny capsids, so it's necessary and sufficient for the plea to drive the formation of small capsids. And we used um, cryo-EM on um, capsid intermediates that are referred to as procapsids. So you can just in E. coli express capsid proteins and a scaffold protein which directs the assembly of the capsid. If you take the ICP-1 proteins, you can make um, procapsids that resemble what you would expect from the virus, which eventually builds a T equals 13 capsid. If you co-express the scaffold TCAP from plea, you get these tiny procapsids made in E. coli, so it's sufficient. And beautiful cryo-EM data shows that indeed this scaffold is an external scaffold that basically forms a cage-like structure around the assembling capsid to restrict its size. Okay, so this is the mechanism by which PLE uses to modulate capsid assembly. So I've told you a series of mechanisms that we know are each inhibitory on their own. Um, DNA replication is inhibited, capsids are remodeled, it makes lysis go a little bit faster and the, and the phage suffers from that mechanism. These are just three mechanisms that I've told you about. It turns out that if you knock out all three of these mechanisms, the plea is still inhibitory. <laughs> turns out that if the plea doesn't excise or replicate, it's still inhibitory. So we know of at least two other mechanisms of single gene products that are sufficient to block the phage. Okay, so what this means from the phage's perspective is that it's being attacked at several different stages of its life cycle. It is impossible, as far as we can tell, both in our hands and in nature, to evolve mutations that allow for escape of each of one of those components, even though individually, if you express a single um, inhibitory protein, you can just get point mutations that stop the interaction. So actually, when you express TCAP, the scaffold, you get suppressor mutations in the capsid protein. This helps us figure out how these things work. But in nature, we don't see any evidence of that occurring. So then this sort of brings me back to how I started the talk, which is thinking about, okay, well, Vibrio can resist the phage and we have this collection of, of phages over time. It must, the, the phage must have evolved mechanisms to overcome the plea in nature. And could this contribute to the diversification of pleas that we may see in nature? And I haven't told you that we do see it, but I'll explain it. Um, and so we take advantage of our phages again to understand how phages may overcome these mechanisms. And so I'll tell you about um, three distinct mechanisms of how ICP-1 copes with plea in nature. And uh, I should have started with this, but one question is like, does it need to? This is a mobile genetic element. Maybe it's not in all strains. Maybe the phage doesn't encounter it that often. So a big part of our work is, um, is surveying Vibrio cholera genomes. We are engaged in collaborative efforts to collect Vibrio from endemic regions, sequence those strains and understand what genomic fluctuations are, are we're seeing. We also, of course, mine data to look for the presence of elements we're interested in. This is our sort of more recent analysis of about 3,400 Vibrio cholera genomes 
that are collected at the, as the early 1918, I believe, but they're all clustered here because you can see there's only like 10 genomes. <laughs> but of course, we're getting more and more genomes as time goes on. And then we asked how many of those um, strains have PLE, and then what variant of PLE do we see? So you can see here that PLEs are somewhat persistent, but dynamic, right? So there's usually strains that are, are presumably epidemic strains that don't have PLE, but at a given time, you can see that the population could be dominated by PLE positive strains. We also see a pretty interesting dynamic where a given PLE variant will circulate for some time, it could be sort of rarely for a, a year, could be a decade, and then we tend not to ever see it again. It disappears and we don't see it circulating. Instead, we see it being replaced by a new variant. So on the right-hand side are just sort of the color codes for each of the 10 P variants that we've described. And I'll show you sort of towards the end about more specifically how they vary. But a message I wanna get across at this point is that broadly, these mobile elements are mosaics of functional gene modules. So what this means is that a given PLE will always have the necessary components to mobilize in response to phage infection, to manipulate packaging of its genome, which is an area I didn't talk about, to replicate in response to phage um, infection and steal that replication machinery, to assemble these modified virions and genes that include genes to help lyse the cell. So they all have the same components. They're all in the same order, but the identity of the proteins executing these functions varies across pleas. And this gives us a hint. Why would pleas need to encode different variants of the mobility module when they respond to the same phage? Why vary it, right? Same with the replication. And our hypothesis is that this mosaicism is being driven by counter adaptations or inhibitors in the phage. So if the phage finds a way to out, outdo this replication module, a different replication module has to be selected for. And I'll show you our evidence for that. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, three mechanisms of counter defense that we've discovered. Um, the first one is actually what led me to discover PLEA, and that is that some ICP1 isolates encode a fully functional CRISPR-Cas system. So this is highly unusual for viruses and um, the phage basically makes use of a multi-component type 1F CRISPR-Cas system that um, has spacers that match protospacers in the PLE genome. It elaborates the system early in infection. PLE still excises in response to infection, attempts to replicate, but is quickly degraded by the action of the CRISPR-Cas system. And this allows the phage to gain the upper hand and once again, win in a PLE positive scenario. Now, we knew from um, our genomes, you know, CRISPR-Cas is kind of a, a big part of the phage genome when it has it. It's about eight kilobases of 120 KB genome. So it's a big chunk of the genome to dedicate to anti plea defense. And not all strains of the virus have CRISPR-Cas. So one of my former students set out to ask the question, how do phages that do not have CRISPR-Cas counter plea? And one of the beautiful things about microbial genomes and viral genomes in particular, they organize things for you so nicely. So and instead of encoding CRISPR-Cas, phages instead can encode a single standalone anti nuclease. So they either have CRISPR or this anti nuclease. So why did we think this was an anti nuclease? The answer was because the, um, this nuclease, which we called an origin-directed nuclease, which I'll explain why, or ODN. So this phage-encoded nuclease has an N-terminal DNA binding domain that's about 40% identical to the replication protein of the plea. So it mimics the replication protein, the N-terminus of this protein. We had a crystal structure of this. We knew this was the DNA binding domain of this protein. And my student had already showed in a previous um, publication that this protein binds to the origin of replication at discrete sequences referred to as iterons. So instead of um, just the DNA binding domain and a C-terminal, presumably replosome recruitment domain that allows the plea to steal that replication machinery, the C-terminus was a very obvious endonuclease domain. So we hypothesized from this very simple architecture of this protein that it would actually produce a protein that would localize to the plea origin of replication and then could cut that origin of replication. And so we showed this genetically and we also showed it through purifying 
The ODN enzyme, a catalytic dead version of it, is incapable of cutting the origin of replication in vitro. If you add the catalytic active variant of this enzyme, it increases in concentrations to a PCR um, product derived from the origin of replication. You get cleavage sites that precisely map to where those iterons are in the origin. And if you delete the iterons, it's no longer susceptible to cleavage. So this was a really cool mechanism. Um, but of course, it sort of begged the question, well, if this is so good, and it really is very good, it's a small enzyme, totally blocks plea replication, presumably because it targets right at the origin, um, the phage can win with it. Why encode CRISPR, right? Like that's a really complicated thing to do when you could just encode this. And the answer is fairly, specific, or fairly um, simple. This is a site-specific nuclease by virtue of the fact that it mimics this one variant of the replication module. So please that encode different replication modules, such as um, these pleas that I'm just schematically showing you with the green module, they encode a rep A protein. They have the same C terminus, but the N terminus of the rep A protein that they encode is variable, and they encode a variable cognate origin of replication. So the rep A protein and the origin have to be compatible, but as long as a plea has a compatible replication module, it can replicate. So what this does is that this gives these pleas a selective advantage. They're no longer susceptible to cleavage by this origin-directed nuclease because it simply cannot recognize that sequence, right? So this gives us a clue that maybe this origin-directed direct nuclease has provided some of the selective pressure, perhaps all of the selective pressure, um, for pleas to adopt variable replication modules in nature. The next mechanism I'll talk about is sort of hot off the not yet press. Um, this is another mechanism um, that we just described. We don't understand it fully. It's very interesting, but it started with a similar observation. We had a phage that did not have CRISPR and yet could still overcome certain plea variants. And it started with the observation that it could successfully replicate in the face of plea two. So we discovered um, through a series of genetic screens that this came down to a very small protein that we named ADI, and I'll explain why we call that ADI in a moment. Um, we showed that this ADI protein is necessary and sufficient for this um, phage to antagonize the plea. It's a small protein of unknown function, only 147 amino acids. And unlike ODN or CRISPR, there was no predicted DNA binding activity and no nuclease activity. So we were a little bit stumped at how this little protein could presumably achieve the same sort of mechanism? How could it precisely attack and degrade this, this replicating competing genome? So what we decided to do is um, go after, again, one of our favorite approaches, which is just deep sequencing during infection, to look for evidence of um, cleavage of the plea and perhaps at specific sites. So was the plea being targeted for degradation and was it being targeted at precise sites? And so what, to do that, we compared um, an infection where the plea was allowed to replicate unperturbed compared to an infection where the phage encoded ADI. We looked at ratio of the coverage across the plea genome and then mapped particular locations where we saw evidence of cleavage dips or dropouts that represent sort of valleys, putative sites for nuclease activity. And this is actual real data here. This is T equals eight and 16 minutes post-infection we saw one precise valley in the plea in the presence of ADI. And what was very interesting is that this site is actually the circularized junction. So the at P circularized junction that only forms once the plea excises, right? The first thing that happens is the plea jumps out of the chromosome, circularizes. That new site is the target for ADI activity. Now, we were a little bit perplexed um, because we were able to demonstrate that if you clone just the at P sequence, which we thought was sort of the necessary target site into a strain that lacks the integrase that otherwise wouldn't make this site, ADI has no activity. So it wasn't just the formation of this at P target sequence that was required for ADI activity, but actually the um, ADI um, anti plea activity requires the plea integrase. Okay, so not just for formation of AP. Again, the plea integrase is a DNA binding protein with catalytic activity to cut DNA. Its job is to do so precisely, right? Its job is to precisely cut the DNA and then ligate it back together to allow for recombination to occur. 
And so what we were seeing was, was different than sort of just integrase mediated activity. We also had a clue from a really simple experiment, which was just co-expressing the proteins in Vibrio. What happened? ADI by itself, which is in pink, is not toxic to cells. So this is not what you would expect if this is a true nuclease on its own. The integrase also is not toxic to Vibrio on its own, again, because it's a precise nuclease. There's one attachment site, it's not gonna do anything. However, when you co-express those two proteins, you see really robust cellular toxicity. And we wanted to confirm that the cellular toxicity was associated with nuclease activity. So we took a microscopy-based approach. And you can see here that when either protein is expressed in Vibrio, you can see the outlines of the cells here by DIC. You can fluorescently stain the DNA and then do traces. And you can see these nice intact cells loaded with DNA. You co-express the proteins, the cells are intact. There's no DNA. Okay, so um, along with this assay, we also did a plasmid depletion assay to show that just ADI and integrase expressed in cells, if you introduce a plasmid with an attachment site on it, you get preferential degradation of that plasmid and not an empty vector control. These two proteins alone are sufficient to mediate the site-specific degradation of the AT sequence. We presume that that um, specificity is being driven entirely by the integrase. So our model is actually that the integrase is um, the activity of the integrase is being modulated by this ADI protein. We suspect that there's a direct interaction between these proteins that then sort of turns the integrase on its head and now it aberrantly cleaves its own genome. Okay, so we, we have evidence that the, catal the catalytic activity um, of the integrase is required for this toxicity and nuclease activity. Um, and we were unfortunately unable to recapitulate this in vitro, but that's sort of the model um, of where things stand. So once again, when we think about sort of this mechanism and how this contributes to the diversification of pleas in nature, we once again see just like the ODN story that pleas can encode diverse um, mobility modules. So they all encode a large serin recombinase. They all have to respond to phage infection through excision and then subsequent interact, uh, integration. But only a subset of the pleas are susceptible to ADI activity and the other ones encode integrases that are resistant to its activity. Again, suggesting that this phage counter adaptation has helped to contribute to the diversification of pleas in nature. So putting this together, um, always save a good complicated slide till the end of your talk, right? Good lesson. Um, so here are the pleas. This is the actual mob alignment of each of the pleas to the DNA alignment here. The colors in purple represent DNA sequence that is conserved among all the pleas. And then the variable colors tell you that they match between particular pleas. So all of them encode this integrase, but it's a little hard to tell. This flavor of integrase is actually encoding a divergent protein than this one. What this does on the end is give you a host range. These ones are resistant to ADI. These are susceptible. These are resistant, same with the ODN. So this helps us to sort of start to tease apart what could have driven the diversification of these pleas in nature. I will say that um, our understanding up to this point was that CRISPR-Cas was the magic bullet. That CRISPR-Cas, as long as there was a matching spacer, could target any plea. And this is a fully functional, can adapt CRISPR-Cas system. Um, so this, this seemed like the magic bullet for the phage. Um, we are engaged in ongoing collaborative efforts to continue to survey epidemic strains of Vibrio cholera and understand what emerging pleas are coming up and what, what ICP-1 is doing in response. And this was the picture um, from our recent publication that made me admittedly very nervous. And another reason to not be happy in 2020 is that plea went away. So um, I was a little bit like, uh-oh, you know, maybe another plea will come and how long will it take? My whole lab is, you know, a lot of our lab is dedicated to understanding the biology of this element. Um, fortunately for us in 2021, we saw the emergence of a new plea that has quickly emerged to dominate the epidemic landscape. So if this y-axis went up to 100%, that would be what's happening right now in Bangladesh. Every single epidemic strain um, has plea 11. This plea is really interesting. Um, and I'll just leave you with this teaser. It is not susceptible to CRISPR-Cas. It is not susceptible to ODN. It is not susceptible to ADI. So we do not have any ICP-1 isolates yet that can overcome this plea. And we're eagerly awaiting our next sort of shipment of school samples to see what in nature the phage has done to overcome this new variant. 
And with that, I'd like to thank my lab. A lot of um, recently graduated and folks who have moved on contributed to this work, as well as my current students. Um, these, this work would not be possible without my collaborator in Bangladesh, Munir Alam, and then my collaborators for the Cryo EM. I'd like to thank my funding, and I've left a few minutes for questions, hopefully. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanks, Kim. Uh, the, the number of layers and this sort of interactions are always fascinating. Uh, okay, so do we have any Zoom questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, here. All right, so we'll start with one from Zoom. Does it sound like this is on? Great, all right. Um, are you finding PLE outside Vibrio? Yeah, so we have mostly found fleas in Vibrio cholera. We do have a recent publication that hints at some similar um, satellites outside of cholera strains in Vibrio. So in Vibrio algonoliticus and I think Harvey I, um, it was the Nixi publication. We don't know what exactly to call them. We should be calling them fleas or not. <laughs> so we just said they're probably similar types of satellites, but the actual pleas, which we define by nucleotide similarity, are restricted to the bro cholera. Awesome. Questions? Oh, plenty. Okay. All right. 